Ukraine. Uh, what was uh, Victoria Newland's role <laughs> in Ukraine? Well, so first of all, Victoria Newland, importantly, is the wife of Robert Kagan, who is one of the most important and influential neoconservatives. He and Bill Kristol coined the phrase benevolent global hegemony to describe America's imperial posture in the world. He was one of the primary intellectual architects of Iraq War II and the you know entire terror war era. His brother, Fred, was a major proponent of both the failed Iraq and Afghan surges and is married to Kimberly Kagan, who is the head of the Institute for the Study of War that churns out papers justifying all of these wars and all of these things. It's a, an extremely important family. I'd also like to hasten to point out, because it's unbelievable until you hear it, and then you go, man, I can't believe he was right about that, that Fred Kagan, and again, this is Victoria Newland's brother-in-law, and his father, Donald Kagan, her father-in-law, on September, I'm almost sure it was the 13th, Keith, it was either September 12th or 13th, uh, 2001, said that George Bush should send the Marines to the West Bank to cleanse it of Palestinians and steal it all for the Israelis under the excuse of the September 11th attack. That gives you any idea of, you know, what matters to the Kagans. So in, oh, here's a little side point too about Victoria Newland. I really like this. In uh, 2012, the end of 2012, you'll hear me say this from time to time, where even the State Department admitted that Javed al-Nusra was just, in their words, an alias for al-Qaeda in Iraq. And I like that because it's kind of a unique thing. Like, usually people don't use alias for groups, only like for a person, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? They would just say, this is another name for it or something like that. So it just really sticks out. Well, the State Department admits that Javed al-Nusra are moderate rebels, or are our moderate rebels' very best friends and associates. Uh, that's just an alias for Al-Qaeda in Iraq. You know, Satan, the enemy, pure evil, Zarqawi from the last war on the other side of the line. And that press release from the State Department, byline, Victoria J. Newland. I just like that. Mm. I think it's funny. Anyway, um, not that she would be against the policy. She's just saying. Um, now, in 2014, in 2013, the United States and the, well, the Europeans had a big meeting with the president of Ukraine, Yanukovych, and he was the pro-Russian leading guy from the party of regions from the eastern half of the country. He'd won a democratic election supervised by the European Union in 2010, and he was the guy that Paul Manafort was working for that all the Russia gate liars tried to pretend that Manafort and, and, you know, was a Russian agent and, and his tie to this guy was the proof. If anything, Manafort's association with him raises suspicions. It's not proof, but it certainly raised suspicions that Manafort was actually CIA and was working very hard to get Yanukovych to do what the Americans wanted him to do rather than, you know, your, obviously question begging ridiculous democratic party conspiracy crankery about Russia, where all of this must mean that Putin is directing it all against us. And the conclusion always has to come first there. But anyway, um, they met with this guy in, uh, I'm going to say it was October. Maybe it was November of 2013. And he was supposed to sign a new trade deal with the European union. And the deal was, um, that, well, they changed the deal on him. Once he got there, they said, okay, the deal now is if you sign a deal with the European Union, you can't sign a trade deal with the Russians. And not only that, but you've got to take out a $15 billion loan so we can help, you know, build up your economy, but also enslave you to debt to, in the Western American imperial system, right? Yeah. And Yanukovych said, ah, geez, you know, I sort of feel like a bride who showed up at her wedding to be presented with a prenuptial agreement. And I got to tell you that, you know, the romance has kind of left the room and I'm not really feeling it anymore. You know, I kind of like this guy's sense of humor. I don't really feel like marrying you anymore anyway. So you can take your prenuptial and shove it. How about that? You know? Uh, and so he didn't sign it. He went home. The Russian deal was we don't care if you have a deal with the EU. You can have a deal with the EU, too. And by the way, we'll give you a couple of billion dollars instead of loaning you 15. So why not sign a deal with us? So he did that. He rejected the EU deal. 
And then this led to a massive protest movement among Ukrainian nationalists in the west of the country and in the capital city of Kiev. And the thing of it is that, um, you know, it's I don't think it's that they really were so intent on joining the EU that they were just so pro-German and so pro-American that they really wanted to tilt hard to the West. I think really they were more independence minded, the, the protesters themselves. And their problem was they saw this as a capitulation to Putin, that Putin wouldn't have wanted to sign the deal with the EU. And they would certainly rather be with the EU than the Russians, at least. The country is very divided in Russian speakers in the East and Ukrainian speakers in the West. And in fact, even that's oversimplified because under communism, they outlawed Ukrainian. They try to force everybody to speak only Russian. So there's, you know, all kinds of horrible legacies of communism and of World War II, uh, which we'll get to in just a second, because when the protesters came out in November and through December of 2013 and into January 2014, they were joined by a bunch of Hitler loving Nazis from groups like the Svoboda Party, which had previously been called the Social Nationalists. Get it? The social nationalists. Right. Um, and then and they're and right sector and the Azov Battalion and these other groups. And these are the proud grandsons of the Galatian SS who helped fight on the side of the Nazis during World War Two and helped to precipitate the Holocaust against Jews and Poles there. And so, you know, in America, liberals and conservatives call each other commie and Nazi all the time over there. They really mean it. And it's true. <laughs> yeah. You know? In fact, I saw a thing where a crowd of Nazis beats up an old woman who is kneeling in respect, like laying flowers at the feet of a statue of Vladimir Lenin. I'm like, yeah, okay, well, she is a communist and they are Nazis. I'm like, okay, that's not hyperbole. <laughs> like, that's exactly just like in the insult, you know? Um, these are pretty stark divisions, man. Uh, many of them remain. Now, the American goal is to run off with Ukraine. And the thing of it is, man, before I tell you about Victoria Newland's phone call, let me tell you about Jeffrey, uh, no, 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 um, Gideon Rose. Gideon Rose is the editor of Foreign Affairs Magazine, which is the Journal of the Council on Foreign Relations, the most prestigious and oldest foreign policy think tank in America, founded after World War I by J.P. Morgan's guys. And Gideon Rose in, um, I'm going to say the second week, early in the second week of February of 2014, went on the Colbert show. This was back when he was a comedian on the comedy channel before he became a, back when he was a conservative character and was funny before he was himself just a plain old liberal <laughs> and was not. But anyway, um, I don't know whose idea this was to put Gideon Rose on the Stephen Colbert show to explain that this is what we're doing here is kind of a weird kind of a press release. But he says, look, we're overthrowing the government of Ukraine. Here's what we're doing, Stephen, is we've got to, you know what? I might've got this wrong. This might've been just after this coup. This might've been like two days after the coup or something. Forgive me. It's been what is this, eight years, seven years. Uh, eight, I can't do math either. Um, but anyways, right around, right, right, just either right before or right after the coup. And he's saying, so look, the deal is, Stephen, is Ukraine is like Russia's girlfriend. And we're trying to steal her away from him. Ukraine is like Robin to Russia's Batman. And we're trying to break up the partnership. And we want to take Ukraine away from Russia. And we think that while Putin's distracted with the Sochi Olympics, that we can get away with it and he won't be able to do anything about it. And on and on. You can watch the video. It's still online. It's really instructive. Uh, see, if we move fast enough, Keith, it'll just work. And Putin, he won't be able to do anything. Now, I know the rest of the day, you know, all of the rest of the time we spend pretending that Vladimir Putin is the most brilliant and malevolent genius in the history of mankind <laughs> responsible for every election result everywhere in the world, whether we approve of it or not. 
And everything that everyone thinks about every topic, too, is all because Vladimir Putin told them to. And everybody knows that. But in this case, that dumb son of a bitch, we're going to steal his Canada away from him. And he's not going to do anything because we assured ourselves of that. Uh Uh-huh. Great, guys. Good thinking. Okay. Now, we find the exact same kind of garbage coming out of the mouth of Victoria Newland, Robert Kagan's disgusting wife, on the phone. She was the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, which is essentially the ambassador to the European Union. And she's on the phone, intercepted, busted on the phone with Jeffrey Pyatt, who was the ambassador to Ukraine at the time. And it's pretty obvious, although nobody can prove it, I guess that the Russians intercepted the call and then they placed it on YouTube. Now, this is a famous call, Keith. Everybody knows about this because on the call, Victoria Newland famously said, well, F the EU and the F word is a bad word. And even though this was huge news, I mean, I really don't know exactly how this happens. It almost makes you wonder if there's like some kind of black magic dust that they sprinkle over a voodoo doll or some kind of thing (laughs) to just make everyone just adopt the exact same line and repeat all the exact same phrases, um, you know, when it comes to these kinds of things. The but, new uh, normal. Yeah. 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 The new normal. That's a great one. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm sorry, because I lost my train of thought off on that tangent about what it was that she said that was uh, such the cliche there. Um, I'm sorry. I'm an idiot. But just anyway, the point being that she's essentially saying to Pyatt, oh, I, about the, the F the EU thing. Such a. Somehow they got every media person in the world to pretend that the only newsworthy thing about that phone call was that this diplomat had used a bad word on a private phone call. Oh, my God. F the EU. How offensive. Oh, well, all the ladies in our sewing group have never been so scandalized or something. Right. But then they never said, well, what was the phone call about? And why would Vladimir Putin bother posting it on YouTube? And why in the world would Robert Kagan's wife be mad at the European Union anyway? And is anybody allowed to ask any of these questions where anyone can hear it? And does anybody have to answer? You know? Nope. She said the bad word, the big F word, the F the EU thing. Why'd you say the F the EU? You know, I'm really sorry that I said F the EU. I apologize. I should never use a word like that. It's just like with Madeleine Albright. You said the price was worth it to kill 500,000 children. I know. I never should have said it that way. You're right. But then nobody (laughs) ever says, yeah, but what about the children? Do you regret (laughs) murdering the children? Or you just regret saying the price was worth it? Do you still think the price was worth it? Or can we get to the point? You know? No. Here's the point. Why F the EU, Keith? F the EU because they're taking too long on our coup d'etat. That's all. The Germans, well, they said they're going to take care of a, care of it for us, and they're taking too long. So I'll tell you what, at the EU, what we're going to do is we're going to get Vice President Biden, and we're going to get Robert Seri from the United Nations, and they're going to come together, and we're going to glue this thing together. We're going to midwife it, and we're going to set it sail before Putin can shoot it down. The same thing as Gideon Rose brags to Stephen Colbert. What we're going to do is we're going to get away with it. And why? Because I think so. And Putin won't do anything about it. Why? Because, I don't know, I hadn't thought of what he might do. And so, I guess it'll be fine. And then what happened? They succeeded in the coup just two weeks later. And this is what's amazing about this, right? This call, forget Gideon Rose and the timeline there. This call with Victoria Newland was late two weeks before the coup. And then they did it anyway And then the results were exactly as she said. Oh, we don't want Klitschko in the government. We want him on the outside propagandizing it for the thing and helping with the branding and all that. Yats is the guy, uh, Arsenin Yatsenyuk. We want him to be the new prime minister. And, you know, this and that. It's all there. That's exactly what happened. Yats is the guy. He became the new prime minister. He was in the job for, you know, what, three, four years. And the, one of the major leaders of the Social Nationalist Party, Andre Perubi, the Nazi, became the Speaker of the Parliament. And, you know, the, the Nazis, people go, oh, well, the Nazi party's lost in the fake election that they held, that the entire, you know, eastern half of the country didn't vote in and weren't allowed to vote in. 
but hey, we held an election, so let's pretend it wasn't a bloody coup d'etat junta, but instead was some kind of, well, it, was, it wasn't that bloody. Well, there's some sniping. There was slightly bloody. Um, but let's pretend that this uh, coup d'etat junta is totally legit because they held some elections. And look, the Nazis, the Nazi parties did very poorly in the elections. Yeah, but how did the Nazis do? Because they all left their old parties and joined up with these other parties that did very well in the elections, actually. And, you know, that's how this guy Perubi became the Speaker of the Parliament. And then all these Nazi groups joined the army. And what happened was, and uh, James Carden pointed this out, that um, the British Parliament's uh, investigation showed that four different uh, and I didn't know this at the time. I only found out about this later. But four different former Ukrainian presidents signed a letter saying now's our chance to kick the Russians out of the Sevastopol naval base. Well, that is their only 24, uh, you know, uh, sorry, 52 week a year warm water naval port. And, you know, the rest of them are all frozen over in the wintertime. You know, it's an a, extremely important strategic asset. And Ukraine pardon me, the Crimean Peninsula on which Sevastopol is based there has belonged to Russia since the 1780s when America was under the Articles of Confederation and, you know, before Florida was part of the Union. And the only reason it ever belonged to Ukraine was because in 1954, after Stalin died, Khrushchev, who was from Ukraine, needed to consolidate support with the Ukrainian Communist Party and so he gave it to them basically by decree, the premier of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the, the uh, general secretary of the Soviet Union, decreed that it belonged to Ukraine now. Then when the Soviet Union fell apart in 1991, they made a deal that said, what the hell, you guys can keep it just as long as you protect the rights of the majority ethnic Russian population there. And as long as you let us keep our naval base at Sevastopol. So now after the coup, they go, come on, let's kick the Russians out of the naval base of Sevastopol. And Putin says, yet, and has all of his sailors tear off their insignia, <laughs> just to confuse the issue for a minute, I guess. Grab your rifles, boys, and go outside, find a street corner and stand on it. And that was it. They were already there. They didn't invade from Russia. They were already there at their base. And essentially, they just all went outside and seized the Crimean Peninsula in a coup de main where which means you know no battle they just take it and it's over and in fact there's footage i've seen the footage of the only two shots fired were over the heads of a couple of ukrainian soldiers and these russians fire a couple shots over their head and go you boys better turn around and leave now those days are over now it's the new ones and they say okay and go and that's it and so then they go, oh, Russia, the aggression, the war crime, and Vladimir Putin and seize the Crimean Peninsula, which you're not supposed to do that. It's a violation of the international law that Russia signed up for. They claim to still respect the Soviet Union's signature to the UN Charter. They don't have the right to do that. You can't do that. But come on. America just overthrew the government there, and they were threatening to kick <laughs> them out of their naval base. Don't you pretend like, oh, where well, Russian aggression just broke out for no reason, and it's sure not our fault. It's nothing Victoria Nuland or Gideon Rose could tell you that we did that might have provoked such a thing. It's impossible to understand. It's just Russian aggression, I tells you. Yeah. And then... The people in the east of the country who had voted for Yanukovych, their president who got overthrown in the violent street putsch, they said, well, look, if you guys can criminally occupy buildings and refuse to respect the authority of the elected government, <laughs> we can do the same thing, too. So they occupied all the government buildings in the Donbass region. Donetsk and Luhansk are the two big kind of provinces. I forgot districts or counties or whatever exactly you call them out there. Um, but in the Donbass region there, in the far east of Ukraine, where they're all Russian speakers and very close to the Russians. And then the new government in Ukraine declared war on them, called it a war on terrorism and attacked them and started mercilessly butchering them. And then they again call that Russian aggression and pretended the Russians were invading Ukraine when all the Russians were doing was sending special operations forces across to help the people of the East defend themselves from the American backed onslaught there. And certainly worse than 2000 pe or uh, 10,000 people were killed in the fighting in the East there through 2014 and 15. Famously, a plane was shot down, although it's not a proven fact either way, exactly how that plane uh, was shot down plane airliner full of civilians. 
over that battlefield. And, um, you know, could have led to war. And if you imagine the shoe on the other foot of the Russians trying to pull a stunt like this in Canada, we'd have gone to war a long time ago. Mm. And the fact that Putin continues to call us, oh, our, our American partners who we sometimes have minor disagreements with and this kind of thing is just absolutely a blessing. It's incredible. Although they have made themselves very clear that uh, any attempt by the United States to bring Ukraine into NATO will be met with force that they absolutely will not tolerate. Oh, and I should say it was the French and the Germans who uh, brought an end to the war in the east. They came to Obama in 2016 or no, 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 15. They is is actually really interesting. How's that? I would have liked to read like kind of some long form journalism about what was going on in this. Maybe some was done in Europe. I don't know. But this is unique, I think, Keith, that the president of France and the chancellor of Germany came to Washington, D.C., apparently just to tell Barack Obama, the president of the United States, we're going to end this war in Ukraine. We're going to Minsk. We're going to make a deal with Putin and you're going to like it, Mr. President. Thanks. They flew all the way here to tell him that to his face. We're in in this war. OK, Barack. And he said, OK, fine. And then they went to Minsk and the first deal somewhat fell through. And then they did Minsk, too. I think this was before Minsk, too, actually, that they did that. Um, and then so that thankfully brought an end to the war. I mean, there is still low level fighting there, but extremely low level compared to the way it was in 2014 and 15. It's just a catastrophe. And then you can read in The Intercept, man, about how, tell me you're surprised about this, that a bunch of jihadis from Syria, the CIA's guys, were traveling off to Ukraine to fight with Ukrainian Nazis in the military against the Russians and kill some Russians. And that's the way the USA does business, I'm afraid. The book is Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. Visit Scott at antiwar.com and the Libertarian Institute, where I am also a contributor. Scott Horton, thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you, Keith.